Why did we start looking beyond Indy? So this starts coming down to a couple of things that we wanted to achieve. So when we look when we looked at how do we create an incentivized mechanism, um, we looked at like what has changed since 2016 to now, um, and what's changed is there are a plenty of token focus protocols to take advantage of. Some of these, which you might have heard of, like Polkadot, Stellar, Cosmos, as well as new infrastructure that has come up, such as uh, Uniswap, which which is a decentralized exchange. What we also wanted to achieve, if we go on to the next one, is to truly decentralize the governance of these networks. Um, as a consequence of like, you know, how Hyperledger Indy is built, um, some of the networks need to remain permissioned, as in uh, the, the people who participate in the blockchain network have to be restricted. And what we wanted to build is much more of a decentralized system where people are able to vote online um, and therefore contribute to the governance on the network. And, and some of the logos that you see here are called decentralized autonomous organizations, and we want to go towards that ideal. If you go on to the next slide, what we also wanted to achieve is a mechanism of exchange of paying for digital identity exchanges um, also needs to have better support from places that provide people access to this. So for instance, if you think of the likes of Coinbase, Gemini, Kraken, Binance, which are all centralized exchanges that uh, that allow access to blockchain tokens and the ability to hold them uh, in a safe and secure fashion, I think that's quite important for widespread adoption. What we also wanted to look more on the enterprise side is um, how can we best enable uh, or look at platforms that are supported by what, what uh, custodianship providers like Anchorage, Metaco, Fireblocks, which are some of the providers in the space that give legal and technical custody for uh, digital assets. So if you move on to building afresh, how did we go about this in the past few months that we've been building this together uh, with some of our partners? We started looking at the health of like the open source community across a variety of different blockchain frameworks. And what we have to say is that like Hyperledger Indie actually has a lot of really, really passionate people behind it. Um, and what you see in front of you is the code commit activity or the, the, the volume and the contributions that have happened to various different blockchain frameworks. And what we see is that Hyperledger Indie has a very, very passionate community behind it, um, but with some activity slowed down beyond 2019. Um, that's one aspect of it. But what we wanted to look at is, if you wanted to look at building token mechanisms that are much more extensive, what, what are the other options out there? So just as an example, something you might have heard of is Polkadot, and that has been accelerating 2020 onwards. It's, it's, it has a very great team behind it, but it's still early days. Stellar, one of the other sort of like, you know, frameworks out there had a peak back in 2015, 2016, has had fairly consistent updates since then. Um, but what's been uh, what's been a standout for us when we started investigating is Cosmos. That is a blockchain that has had a blockchain framework that has consistent and diverse code commit activity since 2019 plus. So this plays into what we looked at next and Richard um, and the product team within Verum um, have been a crucial part of this. So what we did is we tested through experimentation and proof of concepts and, and had a very comprehensive evidence-driven methodology to look at, should we go and implement this on uh, by the way, yeah. <laughs> uh, should we go and implement this on Hyperledger Indy or should we go and look at on implementing this somewhere else? What we wanted to achieve is something that is scalable, flexible, community driven, and also energy efficient in terms of when we when we think of decentralized systems. So one of the things that we wanted to consider in a big fashion, if you move on to the next slide, is we wanted to make governance truly democratic in the long term. So for context, Cosmos as a blockchain framework is something that you call proof of stake, where people or node operators put up a financial stake on the network. They uh, often get rewards or fees that are flowing for the transactions that flow through the network in proportion to their stake. Uh, but they can also vote on text and document proposals and software upgrades in proportion of the stake that they have. What's quite interesting here is, is it, it sort of then builds in a built-in mechanism as well for ensuring that 
people adhere to governance standards, people adhere to keeping the uh, network itself safe and secure and patched up and, and running uh, with, with good availability and so on. And we want to build it like this because ultimately we believe that no single company, including Verum, um, should control critical web infrastructure. If you move on to the next slide, what we also wanted to look at is why not just go build a say on Ethereum or somewhere else. And when we thought about this, what we wanted to do is we wanted to minimize the disruption that might be caused to identity related use cases uh, that happen because of non identity things happening in the world. So as an example, if, if ETH prices shoot up because Elon Musk tweets about something or there's something else that's happening in the non-fungible token artwork space that you might have heard about, we wanted to decouple the financial or the economic disruption that might be caused to uh, exchanging digital ID, which is quite often personal and, and company related and time sensitive. We wanted to ensure that the, the costs associated with that don't get, um, don't get disrupted by external events. If you move on to the next slide, the last thing we looked at is the diversity of open source projects and libraries. We wanted to look at are we in good company in terms of what else is out there and some of the names that you might have heard of, uh, which are also using Cosmos, for instance, are Fetch.ai, um, Agoric, Ixo, Binance Chain, Oasis Foundation. Um, and the reason why we wanted to look at this is we wanted to look at a, contributing back to the open source community because we are going to release our own code as open source. But we also wanted to look at what are the existing open source libraries and projects that we can rely on that we can perhaps use to accelerate our own product roadmap. And if you go on to the next slide, um, how are we making it easy for app developers to leverage our network? This is an important one because there have been many companies that are already building on Hyperledger Indie and building SSI applications. So what's our strategy there? And so if you go on to the next slide, our goal is to make it our goal is to make it as easy as possible for digital ID app developers who are currently on Hyperledger Indie, which is by far one of the most extensive networks, um, and as well as other SSI frameworks to adopt our solution. To do this, if you go on to the next slide, we want to create um, software development kits that can be easily integrated into existing applications. And, and, and Richard's team has been pretty instrumental in, in building this and, and supporting Barium in this journey as well. Um, the way that we foresee this is, is mobile SDKs or client software development kits that support the existing mechanisms, uh, such as Hyperledger Indie, that um, are used by many of the applications. At the same time, we also want to support this new standards compliant with the decentralized ID standards, uh, Verum Cosmos credentials that will that, that we are going to launch with over the next few months. Quite important for us is to acknowledge the fact that a lot of SSI credentials that are created on Hyperledger Indie will continue existing on Hyperledger Indie for a while. For a while. And so we need to make it as easy for app developers to continue supporting existing deployments that they have, as well as building in new functionality that, that we might be adding. Which takes us to a couple of other things that we want to bring up. Um, to get to the idea of self-sovereign identity that is truly self-sovereign and can easily be used in the real world by most users, it needs to be agnostic of the technology that it's based on. And that's something that we believe quite strongly. Um, and the rationale there is that people or users are not going to download 15, 20 different applications uh, because their application is incompatible with certain standards. They're going to want to carry their digital credentials in, in a fashion that is comfortable and convenient for them. And so part of that is we've seen over the past year or so, um, a lot more SSI app developers have become interested in supporting multiple networks. The second big reason is um, annual recurring revenue as a node operator. So this is the ability for um, SSI companies themselves to become node operators on the network and be rewarded through the proof of stake mechanisms and be able to participate in the governance as well of the, of the network. And that's revenue streams beyond just software licensing. 